All right. I hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving. I know I did. But let us pray before we get started, okay? Okay. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so much for all of the blessings that you have given us. Uh, thank you for um, uh, this this whole, uh, even this whole week about uh, giving thanks and, and really reflecting on all the blessings that you've given us, Lord. So thank you for that. And I want to thank you also in advance for sending your Holy Spirit to be with us right now as we study your word. Um, thank you again. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so did anyone hear about... Um, Alec Baldwin, about a month ago, and I, I don't mean anyone related to Pastor Baldwin, but there's an actor named Alec Baldwin. Um, has anyone heard, hear anything? No? Well, I don't usually follow celebrity news or anything like that, but this was such a big story that it, it made it to the regular news, and it was all over social media and stuff like that. But um, so Alec, <clears throat> actor Alec Baldwin is in the process of... Um, filming a movie, and um, they were shooting a very close angle uh, scene, and, and um, he needed to fire a gun. Um, they, and usually don't, they do not use real guns if they can avoid it, but because it was such a close shot, it, he was using a real gun. And the prop master signed off saying that the gun was cold, which means it was filled with blanks. So it got to the part where he pulled the trigger, and in doing so, he accidentally killed the cinematographer and injured the director of the movie. And they're looking into why or where, why and where, um, this live am ammunition came from because I mean, it's, it's actually illegal to use live ammunition in, um, in these movies, especially in, in the type of uh, scene that they were filming. And, you know, he, he released a statement saying that he felt terrible for what happened, and he was in, he's in contact with the, the victim's uh, family, and he's supporting them however he can. And I can't really imagine what they can be going through right now, the family members, or even him, especially during the holiday season. You know, that, that's, that's, that's really rough. But it's very rare overall that someone is killed without any malice or any, any anger or anything that's leading up to or contributing to uh, someone's death like that. But, and, and it's really hard to, to judge a situation like that, and I don't mean as, as, us as humans, but as a judge. You know, how, how do we judge? There, there's really no intent to kill or anything like that. Um, but what would happen if something like that happened back in Bible times? Does God give instructions for any type of situations like this? Do you know? Yeah, he does. He does. He does. So let's look at this. Well, I, well, I'm going to read this quote. It's from, it's from the book From Ether Eternity Past, page 367. Um, and it actually covers what we're going to talk about today. She says here, The Lord did not abolish this custom, but made provisions to ensure the safety of those who should take a life unintentionally. So what's the custom? So let's look at that, okay? It is Josh. We're going to go to Joshua 20. We're going to read that chapter real quick. It's only a handful of verses. Joshua chapter 20. It says there in verse 1, The Lord also spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint for yourselves cities of refuge, for which I spoke to you through Moses that the slayer who, uh, who kills a person accidentally or intentionally may flee there, and they, shall, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. And when he flees to one of those cities and stand at the entrance of the gates of the cities and declare his case in the, hear, um, in the hearing of the elders of the city, they shall take him into the city as one of them, and they shall give him a place and he, that he may dwell among them. Then if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not deliver the slayer into his hands, 
because he struck his neighbor unintentionally and did not hate him beforehand. And he shall dwell in the city until he comes before the um, congregation for judgment and until the death of the one who is high priest in those days. Then the slayer may reach Excuse me. Then the slayer may uh, return and come to his own city and um, and the house uh, to the city from which he fled. So they appointed Kadesh in Galilee, um, in the mountains of Naphtali, uh, Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim, um, and Kirjath um, Arba, which is Ibron, in the mountains of Judah. And on the other side of the Jordan, by Jericho eastwards, they assigned Berzer um, in the wilderness on the plain, from the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth in uh, Gilead, from the tribe of Gath, and Golan in Bashan, uh, from the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel, for the stranger who dwelt among them, that whoever kills a person accidentally might flee there and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. Okay, so I think it's pretty straightforward, but if someone was to kill someone accidentally, the killer was to leave everything he knew and uh, know and have and run to the city of refuge. And he will declare what he did um, to the elders at the gate, and they will take him in, and he's allowed to stay there, um, where the city would protect him from the avenger of blood. Who is the avenger of blood? We'll come back to that in a second. Um, the slayer uh, will stay in that city until he faces judgment of, um, and is decided if he is innocent of murder. If he is guilty, he's turned over to the avenger of blood, but if he is innocent, he must stay in the city until the death of the high priest, uh, until, yeah, until the death of the high priest. So, now back to the avenger of blood here. The avenger of blood, um, uh, I looked up a lot of the stuff from the Jewish um, encyclopedia and stuff like that, and there's a lot of biblical things that we'll, be talk, we'll talk to as well, but there's a lot of context here with the, um, the Jewish traditions and stuff like that. So the avenger of blood means the, it is the next of kin to the one who was slain, right? It's the next of kin from the one who was, uh, who was killed. Um, the Hebrew word is goal, G-O hyphen A-L or E-L, depending on what, uh, like in the, in the Strong's it says E-L, when I looked it up other places it says A-L. Um, but it is a title assigned to a family member and they are to, to protect or avenge the family. And the, 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 the avenger of blood is legally allowed to chase anyone who accidentally killed their loved one and they are, by law, uh, they are allowed by law to kill the slayer. However, the spur if this person is inside a city um, of refuge, they are safe from the avenger of blood. And that sounds crazy that this is even in the Bible. It sounds like something out of a movie, right? But it's, um, it's amazing. Like you can read about it more in Numbers 35, 9 to 34, Joshua 20 that we just read. And it's, it's kind of scattered throughout uh, Deuteronomy as well. And also in the book um, from Eternity Past, chapter 48, starting in page uh, 367, there's like a really long... Um, explanation that she covers all of that stuff in. So let's look at the, the scenario as it happened with um, Alec. Um, so he would drop everything he had, everything he knew, and he would run to one of these cities of refuge, right? And well, something I learned, that the cities of refuge were no more than half a day's journey away from anywhere you were in Israel, which is amazing. You know, God planned this thing out. Everybody is to have access to this. Um, the cities uh, were not only for the Hebrews or the Jews, it was for anyone, anyone at all. And, and I don't know if Alec attends a certain church or anything like that, but he would be welcome there. The roads were clear of literally anything that would hinder someone from running, any sticks, any rocks, anything at all, um, and so that nothing could prevent them from um, getting refuge at these cities. 
Also, the roads were had all of these signs, these really big signposts, so you couldn't miss it. There's no getting lost. You knew where you were going by following the signs. So, do you ever wonder why there are some of these like Old Testament traditions and, and, and rituals and stuff that's written down in, 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 in the Old Testament? It, it's amazing because it doesn't seem like it's relevant to us today at all. But let's look at Hebrews 10.1. Hebrews 10.1. It says there, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never uh, with this... Uh, can never, with these same sacrifices which they offered continually year by year, make those um, who approach perfect. Of, co of course, the law that is talking about here is the, you know, the law that's written in the in, in the book of Moses by his hand, um, and the the traditions and the and the rituals and all the stuff that he did with the sacrifices and stuff like that. It 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 showed that there was something that it was supposed to be pointing to. Of course. So, I mean, we, we hear about the sanctuary message and stuff like that a lot, but I, I did some research on the cities of refuge, and it's pretty amazing um, the, you know, what I found. So, there's more that meets the eye here, so let's look at this a little bit more here, okay? So, let me ask you this. Was there a time in our lives where we had this awakening moment where we realize that the reason that Jesus died was because of our sins. And we came to the realization that I did this. You know, we've been, you know, sinning and, and all this stuff, but we didn't realize that, that, that even if we were the only person that sinned, Jesus would still have died because of us. It's amazing. And and Jesus did that purposely. He surrendered his life purposely. But to us who are realizing this for the first time, we're like, oh man, we messed up. This was, a, this was an accident, you know? And then we keep reading the Bible and we see the verse that says that the wages of sin is what? It's death. So what do we do? We run. We leave this life behind. We run to the city of refuge. We don't have time to go back for anything or to take anything with us because the avenger of blood is coming. The way is already paved for you, and we see the clear signs in the way that the world is going, Matthew 24, and we have to get to that celestial city. And the thing is, as we keep running, um, it's hard, um, how do I want to say this? And, you know, as we keep running, it, it's so hard to keep, uh, to keep going forward to the city, but still living, that, living like we used to before. Because can we actually take our sin to the city? No, no we cannot. H has anyone read the, the Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan? Or, yeah, John Bunyan. No? I'd recommend that to anyone. Actually, Ellen White talks about how next to the Bible, the Pilgrim's Progress has won many people over to, to God. It's amazing. It's such an amazing allegory. Um, you can read it. You can listen to it. There's audiobooks. And also, they, like last year or the year before, they made a movie about it. It's animated, but it's very well done. But so Christian, it's about the Christian walk. So Christian starts um, reading the Bible, and he realizes that he has this terrible burden that's growing on his back, and it's, and it's growing bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier. Finally, he, he reaches the cross, and the burden falls off. And he rejoices. He rejoices. He loves it. And, you know, and there's this whole conversion um, that goes on with him. But the thing is, is that as he goes on on the journey, he still goes off the path. He still makes bad decisions, and, and he still ends up in trouble. And that's very much like how a lot of us are. Maybe I'm talking about myself here. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, we end up in, uh, ends up, we end up in, 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 uh, in trouble where, you know, the Holy Spirit is prompting us all along the way, but sometimes we've kind of gotten the habit of not listening or, or, we, or we don't surrender all of the choices or we only give God so much of our lives or whatever the case may be. And 
Anyway, so, but the thing is that we just have to learn how to depend on Jesus more and more, right? And, you know, we carry the guilt with that and, 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 and everything. But let's look at 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. And he said to me, and this is uh, Jesus, this is the words of Jesus here. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities than that, uh, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in, my, in, in infirmities, in reproaches, and in the needs of persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I am strong. So in these times when, you know, we may, we may have fallen off, we, we're not on the path or everything like that, we know that Christ can bring us, um, can make us stronger in these times, and we can really see what grace is like in those times. So, we can, so and, and for some of us, you know, we, we can see where we messed up, and we can correct our course, and we can stay on path and not repeat that mistake again. And I applaud anybody who, who can do that, and, and, and they fix the problem, and boom, they're done. But I know that I'm not like that, you know? At times, I feel like a spiritual dunce, right? Um, I feel like I repeat the same things over and over and over, and I have to, like, train myself. And I, and I know the Holy Spirit is talking to me. And I have to, like, identify and label everything along the way, and I have to say, okay, for example, like, I think, I think this, then I say this, then I do this, and then I feel bad, and I have to ask for forgiveness. So, so, now, so now the Holy Spirit is talking to me, and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. If, if I don't do that, then... Then I, then I won't need forgiveness, and then I can, you know, get myself together. But then, I still think this, and then I say this. I might not have done whatever and kept going, but I still feel bad because then I started, I, I said the thing. <laughs> so, okay, I won't, say, I won't say that anymore. I'll stop. But then I realize, I might not say anything, but I'm thinking a whole lot of stuff up here. <laughs> But, the, but, that's, but that's the root of all of this, right? This is what the battle of the, of the, of, that we're all facing, that's what it's all about. It's what's going on up here. It's the command center for our entire lives. And that's what the war is over. So, and then we have, we have a verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 10, 5, where it says that we have to bring into, into submission every thought into the obedience of Christ, Right? And, and that's how it is. That's how conversion works. We surrender everything to Christ, even down to our thoughts. Anyway, so and while we're dealing with this right now, the, the avenger of blood is drawing closer and closer. So who is this, again, who is this avenger of blood? Like I said, it's the title given to the next of kin, um, to the one who was killed. But like I said, who was killed? Who died? Jesus, right? So who's the next of kin? It's God. Let's look at Isaiah 43, 1. Isaiah 43, 1. Isaiah 43, 1. But now thus saith the Lord who created you, O Jacob, uh, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And you might say, Shane, this doesn't say anything about the avenger of blood. I don't see that in that verse. You're, you'd be right in English. It doesn't say that. But that word redeemed, if you look it up in the Strong's, it's that same word, goal. So the avenger of blood is actually not supposed to be scary at all. God, he's telling us, hey, I'm trying to save you. I'm trying to redeem you. You know, that, that, the word goel, again, is used in the story of Boaz and Ruth. Boaz was the goel, was the, uh, was the avenger or the redeemer to Ruth. And that's how God want, is, is treating us. He's trying to save us this entire time. So look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10. 
1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10. It says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our, uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wow. So he is just trying to save us. He's trying to get all of the human, the human race into the city before he returns. So what happens when Jesus returns? Judg judgment has already taken place. The books are closed. Whoever is holy will remain holy. And whoever is wicked will remain wicked. The righteous returns um, with Jesus for a thousand years. And then the wicked remains here with Satan. You can read about that in Revelation 19 and 20. It gives a chronological um, list there. But after a thousand years, New Jerusalem is coming down. Those who are in the city are safe. Those who choose to ignore the promptings of the Holy Spirit when they had the opportunity, when the Holy Spirit was telling them to run to the city, um, Jesus actually has some solemn words for them. Matthew 25, 41. Matthew 25, 41. And he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So the goal from the very beginning, this whole great controversy that we always hear about, was supposed to be between Jesus and Satan. Jesus was trying to get us out of the middle of that from the very beginning. And we keep... We keep butting in. We, we, we want to be involved. <laughs> Jesus is trying to save us. And he wants, Jesus wants to deal with, with, with Satan. He wants to deal with uh, the fallen angels. And he's trying to deal with this sin issue. And he's trying to get us safe into the city. But the only one that's stopping him from doing that is us. Now you might think. Now you might think when you read through it, if you, I, by all means, read through this more and more later. But you might think that you found a loophole in this whole. Um, uh, you might find a loophole in this whole uh, lesson here. Let's go to Joshua 20, verse six. Let's read one of the verses we read already. Joshua 20, verse six. And you know everyone likes loopholes, right? But look what it says here. Joshua 20, verse six. And he shall dwell in the city until he stands before the congregation of, uh, for judgment and until the death of the one who is the high priest in those days. Then the slayer may return, um, may return and come to his own city and his own house to the, um, to the city which he fled. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, sorry about that. So, and we might say, see, we are to only dwell into the city, dwell in this city until the death of the high priest, and then we can leave the city and go back to do whatever we want. We can go back to our own lives. In fact, Jesus is our high priest, and he died 2,000 years ago. So why are you putting this yoke on me? You know, we can do whatever we want. Jesus died. And, you know, it's funny because people think that way. They really do. Um, we have people who think that once you're saved, you're always saved. You, you can do whatever you want. You have people that believe in, 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 in variations of Calvinism where, Calvinism where like, you know, hashtag some lives matter. <laughs> but ultimately, they're looking for a loophole. They, want to, they still want the benefits of salvation without actually having to do anything. And the thing is, the case with our high priest dying 2,000 years ago, I'm going to have to agree with them. For three days. I would agree with them for three days. Which three days am I talking about? The three days where Jesus died, but he didn't stay dead. Jesus died. But he rose again, proving that we can live a sinless life, a life surrendered to God. And, we, <laughs> and that means 
that not only are we just supposed to just live there, but we have to live in that city for, eter <coughs> for eternity. You know, and that's the thing. Get back to the city. There's no time to waste. Oh, man, it's so exciting. I, I love Bible study. Anyway, but our, our Redeemer, our Goal, if you will, is coming much sooner than we can imagine. Jesus is just trying to save our lives. He's trying to save my life, your lives. He loves you so much. And he wants to spend all eternity with all of you. So what are you going to do? We are going to meet him one way or the other. But I guess the question is a matter of where are we going to meet him? Are you going to meet him in the city? Or are you going to meet him outside the city? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so much for all of your blessings. And thank you so much for Jesus dying on the cross, giving us a way out of this mess. I, I want to... Um, to, to ask um, that we can hear your voice uh, better and clearer, hear your Holy Spirit prompting us um, and then telling us, you know, what we need to do. And I pray that, um, that, we, that we listen to you, Lord. So please help us to do your will because we can't do that on our own. Thank you so much for all of the blessings. Again, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for... Um, all of the hope that you give us in the Bible. And I pray that we will all be there when you return for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. All right, so there are many Bible uh, Sabbath school lessons, or Sabbath school classes, I should say. There's one here in the sanctuary, of course. There is there's one behind these last doors down the hallway here. There's another one at the end of the hallway. There's um, the one in the fellowship hall for young adults. Uh, and there's the kids' classrooms down here on the left. And I hope you guys have a happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It's good to be here this morning. Um, I'm counting on all of you to have spent uh, an extended period of time in study this week to cover up all my deficiencies. As I was going through the lesson, I found a series of words, one for each day. I'm going to tell you those in a minute because I think they encapsulate what was trying to be presented on that particular day. Before we get into the word and into this lesson, let's pray. Gracious Father, this is the week of thanks. It should be a daily experience for us to say thank you. You have done so much for us. We ask now for the, the gift that you've promised to provide if we just ask, and that is your spirit. Be our teacher today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, if you, could, if you have your uh, lesson uh, with you, you could write these words at the top of each of the pages, or you can write them on the back of the bulletin, or you can just say, well, that was interesting, and ignore it altogether. Your choice. So the first day, turn their hearts, 
page 72 in the lesson book I have, uh, is about realizing. The next day, Sunday, is about longing. Monday is about seeking. Tuesday is about choosing. Wednesday is about deciding. Thursday is about acting. And that summarizes this whole lesson about turning the heart. So I'd like to start with realizing. What is it that we need to realize? What do we need to understand? And we start off with this memory verse. From there, you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart. Now, seeking, I said, comes later, but we have to start out with this in Deuteronomy chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and this is the section, verses 25 through 29. I know we're supposed to be focusing on chapter 5 this week because 4 was last week, but there's this, um, this guy who wrote the lesson sort of flows them all together, and it's hard to tease them apart. So we're going to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 4, 25 through 28, and we'll see that in these verses we have from Moses a prophecy. And so as you're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 4, see I should open up mine too. It says, after you have had children and grandchildren and have lived in the land a long time, if you then become corrupt and make any kind of idol, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God and provoking him to anger, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you this day that you will quickly perish from the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not live there long, but will certainly be destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and only a few of you will survive among the nations to which the Lord will drive you. A prophecy. What was the condition of the people when Moses gave this word from the Lord? Where were they chronologically in their experience with God? Okay. What's that? A little louder? At the end of the 40, At the end of the 40 years. Preparing to, cross over. preparing to cross into the promised land. What had they come out of? They had come out of Egypt, where they had been slaves. They had seen the Lord's presence with them daily. The miracle of the manna, the pillar of, the, of cloud and fire, all of those things that they had. And so they're on the borders, and what does God tell them is going to happen? When they cross over, they will go right there and join what they're seeing the people around doing. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. It was terrifying. What they saw. Right. So how could you take whatever equipment and uh, stones or whatever and make something and say that that is a God? He knew they were going to follow. Notice he when he says this prophecy will happen. Was this going to happen right when they got in? No, when you grow old. Okay. When you've gotten old, you've gotten settled, you're well established, you've gotten comfortable, you've been blessed, you've got all kinds of things good happening in your life, and then your children and your children's children. Do we see this in our own lives? <coughs> that our grandparents, if, if you're a multi-generational Seventh-day Adventist, you know, it was much harder to make that decision three generations ago, to become one of this weird little cult, right? And now we're pretty highly regarded. Uh, depends on who you talk to. But seriously, haven't we gotten comfortable? Do you remember how big 
the Battle Creek, I'm, I'm sorry, it, well, that was a, a small one too. It was, it was 12 by 18 feet, the church that they built in Battle Creek, the first one, 12 by 18. What's that? This section over here? And then they built the Dime Tabernacle. It seated 3,000? Wow, how much had it changed in those few years, those few decades. And now we have lots of churches that seat 3,000. Universities, colleges, hospitals. Started out scattered across just North America, and then something happened and it went to the world. And generations have passed. Is the most current generation who has grown up in the church as committed? Now, that's a question that only can be answered individually. But it sure looks a lot different than the pioneers of the movement, doesn't it? And that's what was going on here. And he was saying, look, this is the natural progression. This is what will happen. Why? Why will that happen? This is the realization that we have to come to. Why will this happen? Romans tells us, Romans 3.23. Yeah, I can hear you quoting it out loud already. For all have sinned and fall short. Interesting little, uh, and you've probably heard this explained before, but have sinned is in uh, a tense in the Greek that is uh, an accomplished action in the past. And it's true for how many? All. All of us have sinned. No question, no exceptions. That's pretty uh, harsh reality. This is what we have to realize. But what else does it say? Not only have we sinned, but the next part is and fall short. And the Greek tense here is continuous present. What? Continuous present. We are always coming short of the glory of God. All of our best efforts, Isaiah tells us, are pretty disgusting. We continually, in the present, fall short. That's the realization. That's what the Sunday lesson, or Sabbath afternoon lesson, was supposed to be about. To get us to the place where we realize our condition so that this turn their hearts can happen. Which is what the subject of the lesson is. And then, there's also, though, in this passage where Moses is speaking to his people, an incredible promise and the promise is, from there, you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you will seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Wow. They would have to come to the realization that they had sinned and fallen short. That realization should produce what the next day, Sunday's lesson is about, that longing when you seek me, you will find me with all your heart. Seek me with all your heart. I, um, Clifford Goldstein, the author, uh, grew up as a Jew, had quite a dramatic conversion experience. And so that's why he throws in all these great Hebrew phrases, helping us understand some of what's behind. And here he has the title of the day's lesson is Me Yitten. What does me yitten mean? Why is this such a big deal? Because it is the expression of longing. And they, they give us examples in, in the uh, lesson about all the places where this phrase, this idiom appears. Do we have idioms in English? 
Uh, I had a friend who was a Ukrainian pastor, and we were traveling together one day, and we were talking, and I, I used several English idioms, and he said, I don't understand. And so I had to explain what I was saying. It didn't sound as good. You know, that, that's why we have the idioms. They're usually uh, a catchy way to say what we want to say. Now, one example was, you're pulling my leg. What does that mean? Right? You're putting me on. You're, you're, you're joking with me. You're, he said, oh, we don't ever say that in Ukraine. I said, oh, really? What do you say when you mean that? He said, you're pulling my ear. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's just a different part of the anatomy. But I would never understand you're pulling my leg. I said, and if somebody said, you're pulling my ear, I'd say, what? Same thing. But the idioms help us to understand. And that's what Miyitin does here. It's who will give? An expression of longing. Who will give? And then you have to read the rest of the context to understand what is being earnestly desired. What is causing this longing? So we're given examples of David, these Israelites who are saying me it, and, and of course, then Job. But in Deuteronomy 5, verse 29, God himself uses this. Who will give? What does he say it about? What does he want? God has a longing. We have a longing. God has a longing. What is God's longing? I'd see, I thought everybody had said, yes, sir. The longing is always been the same. The longing has always been the same. If you look at Deuteronomy and you look at, at Jeremiah 29, yep. I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Sounds <laughs> Yet Israel is in very different condition in Deuteronomy than they are in Jeremiah. Okay. But the longing is still the same on God's part. On God's part. Was it better or worse, Deuteronomy versus Jeremiah's day? Jeremiah was in probably a much greater strait. Okay. And the fulfillment of the verses that had just preceded this in verse, I mean in Deuteronomy. Right? The fulfillment that they would be scattered. But some, God has always preserved a remnant of people who have this longing. Their longing matches his longing to be united in heart. That's what God wants from us. He wants us to love him the way that he loves us. When we realize how far short we fall, does that tend to increase? Our longing? It's interesting that by this expression, miyitin, there's also an implication uh, that we can take from this that God will never trample our right to choose to love and accept Him or to reject and abandon Him. Hey, it's left up to us. You've probably heard of the, the doctrine of election and the doctrine of predestination. Are we predestined or not? What do you think? Hmm. And what are we predestined to? I heard one professor explain election in this way. There are three votes. Your vote, God's vote, and the enemy's vote. If you cast your vote with one or the other of those two parties, that's what you get. So what's the predestination? How does this enter in? If that's God's longing, what we just said it was, that our hearts would be united with him, what are we predestined for? Salvation. We are predestined to salvation. Yeah. 
Morris Vennon wrote a book years and years and years ago, it's hard to be lost. Because God loves us that much. We really have to be contrary to make the choice, but God respects it to be lost. Whew. That's a scary, scary thought. We have free will. God honors our free will. But more than anything, his wish, his desire, his yearning is for us to love him as he loves us. Hmm. Because you can never have too much background. In the last days, since we're supposed to be studying present truth in the book of Deuteronomy, I thought this, this quote was, uh, this is from Prophets and King. Uh, it's page 299. In the last days of this earth's history, God's covenant with his commandment-keeping people is to be renewed. <clears throat> from Hosea chapter 2. In that day... Will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground? And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. I will betroth them unto me forever. Yes, I will betroth, singular, you unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercy. I will even betroth you to me in faithfulness. You shall know the Lord. And see, there's that promise from chapter 4, verse 29, when you seek me with all your heart. That heart binding together. We will turn, we will return to the Creator God and to His Word, which is an interesting transition to where Deuteronomy 5 starts. What does Deuteronomy, the, the chapter, what does the chapter start with? The Ten Commandments. Yes. Why? He wants to bring us to the realization. You remember what Paul said, I wouldn't even have known what sin was if it hadn't been for the commandment. The commandments, what are they for? There to bring us to that realization, to spark that longing. My brother was dating a, uh, a Jewish girl, and he and I had had some discussions about the Ten Commandments, and I had mentioned to him in our discussion that the Ten Commandments are promises, not prohibitions. Well, he had without my background in theology, he had said that to this Jewish girl. And she said, your brother's an idiot. He obviously doesn't know Hebrew. She didn't know that I'd been to seminary and actually studied the language. Didn't matter. In her mind, they are very clearly, absolutely ironclad, no other way to look at it, prohibitions. You cannot do these things. Two very different approaches to the law. Do you see it as a prison or as a promise? That's the big difference. It's a promise. If you're in this heart relationship with me, you won't ever have any other gods. You'll never think of making an idol, which was your question. How could you go from seeing Mount Sinai to making idols? Well, if you're in heart relationship, it won't happen, sir.
Because he had a heart condition. He had a heart condition? Yeah. And the heart determines it. It's interesting. Um, our presentation earlier was about the head. We tend to, in, in our idioms, refer to the head as the center of everything. For the Hebrews, it was the heart. That's where all the emotion was. That's where all the decisions are made. Why the heart? When you make a decision, what do you feel? And where does that feeling occur? It doesn't usually occur in your head. The feeling occurs down here. That's why the Hebrews made the heart the center of everything in a human's existence. From teacher, there is something yes. during the lesson that in the same, it started in Sunday where it's the children of Israel now, God has taken them out of slavery, they are free. But as soon as something goes wrong, they throw <coughs> their minds back to the slavery that they came from. God, why did you bring us here? to face all these challenges. And that's a lesson for us. How do we react when there are challenges in our lives? Do we want to go back to what we used to do? Or do we continue to trust God that he will direct our lives? So who's moved? Pardon me? In, in that situation, who has moved? Has God moved away from no, those people? No, no, no. <laughs> we are the ones who always relent. We're the ones who have moved away from yes, him. Yes. We have made the distance between ourselves and our creator. Uh, Adam and Eve. You can't imagine a much closer relationship than those folks had, right? Then they did what they knew they shouldn't do. And then when they heard his voice? The blame game started. The blame game started. But they hid. <laughs> they made the distance. He came seeking. And the same thing was going to happen, and it happened in Jeremiah's day. But if you think about it, there were several waves of this happening. First, the ten northern tribes taken off by the Assyrians and scattered all over the world. Interestingly, those people, too, receive a promise that eventually some of them would be restored. They never had a promise that they would come back to their kingdom. Judah did, the southern two tribes. They went into exile in Babylon, 720, 605. So 100 years difference between their two experiences. The one, the northern 10, that were going to be scattered and never come back to their kingdom. But the southern would be scattered and would be brought back to their kingdom because it was through Judah that the Messiah would come. Wow. Wow. But God has always had a remnant, even among the ten tribes that were scattered. And he has a promise for them, too. So how does that apply to us today? We're looking for present truth in the book of Deuteronomy. We're all Gentiles, aren't we? Well, I don't know. Maybe there's a Kohathai there. <clears throat> but how does that apply to us? Does bloodline matter in salvation? No. In the New Testament, we're told we are all of one blood. And Jesus is our brother. We're all included in these promises. We will all have our hearts turned. Mm. <clears throat> so once we've gone through the realization, the realizing, and the Longing, we come to the seeking part. And that happens when God begins his work in our lives. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, John Wesley called this God's acts of prevenient grace. Oh, theological terms, they're such a stumbling block which means that God is always working in advance to win us. He is always acting as a lover 
toward us. He is compassionate. He is merciful. He is patient beyond imagining how patient he is with us. And then, by all these acts of his grace, he is trying to get us to make that, but it's our decision, which we were talking about a moment ago. Here's where we come into that seeking. What does God want from these people, according to what we read in Deuteronomy 4 and 5? What does he want them to do? He wants them to realize their sinfulness, to realize his holiness, to long for a relationship with him, and then to seek it. This is the turning of the hearts. And notice the title of the lesson is Turn Their Hearts. Who does the turning? Who does the turning? And that's why it's important to understand Wesley's concept of prevenient grace. Do we turn our hearts? Oh. Hmm, there's a challenge for us in that, uh, which leads me to oh, another one of these little books. Uh, this is a, a special edition of Steps to Christ. Um, fascinating. What is repentance? Heart turning. We always talk about it that way. It literally means in the New Testament, <clears throat> metanoia, a turning away from one thing and turning to another. Ellen White says, repentance includes sorrow for sin, the realizing that we have sinned and fall short, and a turning away from it. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. So we see Deuteronomy 5 starts again with the commandments so that once we see how awful sin is, we want to get as far away from it as possible. And it's not just because we want to get away from the punishment, but it's because we want to get close to the creator, the giver of all good things. When the heart yields to the influence of the Spirit of God, the conscience will be quickened and the sinner will discern something of the depth and sacredness of God's holy law, the foundation of his government. This is a great chapter. It's the chapter Repentance in the book Steps to Christ. But listen to this. Repentance does not precede forgiveness of sin. It is only the broken and contrite heart that will feel the need of a Savior. Must the sinner wait until he has repented before he can come to Jesus? No. In fact, God's grace has already drawn. Uh, Romans 2, verse 4. Don't you realize that it's God's kindness, God's goodness, God's mercy that leads you to repentance? That's prevenient grace. That's that drawing that God does to try to bring us to him, to cause this seeking to take place. And so what is it that causes us to seek him? The realization and the longing that he causes to happen in our lives. Pastor. Yes. Oh, yeah. 17, verse 27. Yeah. Where it says they're seeking for him, they're groping for him, like they can't see him, they can't hear him, they can't <clears throat> sense him. Yep. And yet, though he's not very far from anyone. Right. And I think that's what Ellen White's trying to say here. Yeah. Like oftentimes the clouds of Satan, the temptations of Satan, the guilt from that Satan presses on us, yes. cause us not to sense that he is near, when in reality he is there. Yes. Yes, which is how God draws us to him in spite of the darkness, in spite of 
the clouds, in spite of the temptations, in spite of our own disappointment with ourselves, in spite of the almost overwhelming guilt and shame we have, we still hear the still small voice. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Wow, what a great God we have. And this is the seeking. But you know, after all this, you have to choose. And that's the next day's lesson, Teshuvah. Teshuvah. Eh, see, he did it again. What does that mean? This is literally the word in Hebrew for turning or return. Where are we Gentiles returning? If we have never been with him, how can we return to him? Seems strange, doesn't it? Except that we are all God's children. We are all one blood. So the returning is returning to where we were originally intended to be. Children of our Heavenly Father in close, dynamic relationship with Him in order to experience His grace, His mercy, His goodness. That's what He wants us to do. What about the Israelites? Where had they gone? What had happened to them? They'd gotten so comfortable in Israel. They had so many blessings. It's interesting. We only read the terrible, tragic parts, and we think that they were constantly in apostasy. But if you do a timeline out, there are far more years of God's blessing and their obedience in the Old Testament than there are years of their apostasy. It's just that it seems like when they went into apostasy, they went whole hog. Oh, there's one of those idioms. I mean, they, they were just without restraint. They just plunged over the cliff into the worst kinds of dissipations you can imagine. And some of them lasted for a pretty long time. But in total, from when they entered the land, when David became king, let's say uh, roughly 1,000 A.D., to... 720, so we're talking 300 years. In 300 years, there were only about, only about, less than a third of those years, 80, were spent in apostasy. And yet, it was in that apostasy, in those conditions, that Manasseh goes and does what he does. Yeah. Uh, there the horrors that occurred. The northern ten are taken and gone and scattered and replaced. And then another hundred years as Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah, slides downhill the same as their northern brethren did and eventually are taken off to Babylon. But again... In that hundred years, less than half of it was in apostasy. It was just all right there at the end. Well, it was really bad. And they had all the examples, all of the lessons from before. And they ignored them and went down that road anywhere. So he calls them back to him. He brings them back to him because this heart turning only occurs because somebody somehow in the midst of that darkness in the midst of those temptations in the midst of that shame says hey it doesn't have to be this way there's a God who loves us who created us sort of sounds like the story of the prodigal son doesn't it I mean how much worse can you get than he was he says to his dad Drop dead, give me the money. Horrible. What an insult. And in a shame-based society like that was, shame and honor, that was what they all sought, how terrible it was for him to do that. That was the most shameful thing that could be imagined. And it gets worse. He wastes it. Ends up doing something no good Jewish boy should ever do. 
hanging out with pigs. Not like the people he hung out with weren't pigs. But from figurative pigs to real live pigs to wishing he could eat their food. What? Nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth, said the prophet. Don't make me cook my food over that. Yow. All the way down to that. And the prodigal somehow in the midst of that says, my dad, my dad, I got to go back to my dad. And his heart is drawn to his father's care. And he comes back and his father does the strangest thing. In a shame honor society, you are throwing away your honor as a father to run after a shameful son. But love conquers all. He throws off all of the issues of the society. Honor doesn't matter to him anymore. And he runs to his son and clothes him with the robe and the ring and the sandals. He restores him as if he had never fallen. Whoa! That's the picture that this Teshuvah wants us to understand. God is saying to his people, this is what I really want. Will your heart come into harmony with mine? Can we be one? I will make a way. I'll do it. It's interesting that in cutting the covenant, you remember Abraham and the animals, and he cuts them in half, and he lays them out, and he waits, and he chases away the birds, and he falls into a deep sleep because that incredible supernatural darkness overwhelms him. And then the pot, you notice the, the fire pot passes between the pieces. Abraham never does. Abraham never does because he can't pay for his sin is what is symbolized in those divided animals. But God says, if you fail, I'll do this to restore us to our relationship. That's why this teshuvah, this longing, this niyitin is here. He longs for us so passionately. Even death won't stop him from doing whatever it takes to restore us to a relationship. We just need to come to the place where we go, that's what I want. I choose God. So choosing, that was Tuesday's lesson. That brings us to Wednesday's lesson. And I call that deciding. Is there a difference for you between choosing and deciding? Oh, it sounds like we're splitting hair, doesn't it? Is there no difference? Think about it a little bit. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. What am I doing, deciding or choosing? Choosing. Choosing. Choosing is the process. Choosing is the process. Something has to go on in the process of choosing. It has to be the realization, the understanding, the desiring, the seeking. All of that is involved in choosing. Do you know that when, this might not be good to use anymore. If you go to buy a car, a car salesman, if a man goes to the car lot alone, the car salesman will say, take this home and let your wife see it. Take it for a test drive. Let your wife see it. You can't buy it without the wife's decision. If a lady goes in to buy a car, are you married? Yeah. Then you better let your husband see this. Why? Because really, the process of choosing is an emotional one. And you can't make a decision, which is the result of choosing, unless... The heart and the head are together. Oh, 
No decision is ever made. No action is ever taken without the emotions being involved. Which is why even used cars, you get in, you go, smells like a new car. Yeah, it's because they have a can. New car smell. <laughs> you knew that, right? Scary. Why? Because our olfactory triggers our emotions. Why does Thanksgiving make you feel so warm and fuzzy? It's the smells. Christmas. Cut greens, you know, the, the, the live Christmas tree. It's, ah, and all those memories, positive, come flooding back. Now, I know for some people that's all, all, all the opposite. And they hate Christmas for that very reason. Okay, I understand that. But what triggered it? Yeah. And that's what God is doing. That's why he's doing that with these people about choosing. What are they expected to choose between? What are the Israelites being eeny, meeny, miny, mo about? What does he offer them? What does God offer to Israel? What? Prosperity. Prosperity. Beyond their wildest imaginings. What else? Many children. Children, which is eternity for them. Because you pass on the family line, and that's, that's eternity. What else? The crops will be okay. And yeah, just beyond what they could imagine. And the amazing thing is, they had that. And when they got it, they threw it all away. Do we? Ow. So they were given... They, they were given the choice. They got to choose between blessing or cursing, bounding or dearth, eternity or the present, heaven or earth, God or idols. And that leads us to acting. Thursday's lesson. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. What does God say to his people through his servant Moses? Chapter 30, verse 6. Read that silently to yourself. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, and then answer this question. Is this works righteousness? Who will circumcise their hearts? The Lord will circumcise their hearts. How does a heart turn? It turns when God circumcises it. When we have been through the process of realizing, desiring, seeking, and choosing. Yes, ma'am? Like the boy in the pig pit, right? In the prodigal son. He just went, uh, whoa, this is stupid. Yeah, I'm going home. And it actually says, when he came to himself, when he woke up, when he, his right mind came back. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's like they were sleepwalking. But they went from one of the most pleasant dreams you could imagine to a nightmare. And then they woke up. And they said, oh, this is not what we want. And so they half to act. It's interesting though. They have to act, but they can't act unless God does something first. And then, are they even able after that to do it themselves? Can they return? They can't return until he makes the conditions right for them to return. It's all God's grace. If we ever need a grace, we may not be in Babylonian exile. We may not be among those scattered like the northern ten tribes. But boy, do we ever need God's grace. We need him to change us. And then he's promised 
It's the day of Pentecost. When they say, what shall we do? When they realize what they have done, and Peter answers, repent. Turn. Turn back to him. He's drawing you. That's why you asked the question. You turn back to him, and he will empower you. He's going to do something you couldn't even imagine. He's going to send you power from heaven. He's going to send you his personal presence. What God offered to Adam and Eve, his personal presence. It's going to be real for us. It's every bit as much ours now. And think of what would happen if God's church was filled with his spirit. And by God's church, I mean each of us. Filled with his spirit. Intensely longing to know him. And that others would know him too. God would empower us to take this message to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And the whole earth would be lighted by his glory. Wow. There's a whole lot more here. That was fun. Thank you. Time's up. Let me pray with you, and we'll have worship in a moment. Gracious Father, what a joy and privilege it is to spend time in your word with our brothers and sisters who know and love you too. Father, deepen our love for you. Deepen our longing for you. Empower us to be your people in the world that they may see the wonders of your character and choose to know all that you have, all that you are, so that the world truly can be enlightened before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.